Keaton, you may have another one that after Justin kicked it over. Um, it's there. Help yourself throughout the service. Uh, if you want to turn your Bibles, we're going to go straight in for time today because uh, we've got a long scripture, and it's uh, chapter 15 of Acts. And just to say that if you're looking at the screen thinking, why on earth did he choose white on yellow? I have no idea. It just looked really nice. And, and I looked at it earlier and thought, they're never going to be able to read that. It looks really good on my laptop. Um, so I'll, I'll try and sort my life out next time. Um, but I'll read it to you. You have grace. Uh, and just to say, we did the Holy Spirit, uh, a series on the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit about just before COVID. And what's been really lovely about this is that time I sat and I studied extensively. I read so many books on the gifts of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit. Uh, on this occasion, each week I've just been asking the Lord to lead us in a different direction. So we don't regurgitate the same series. The, the, the scripture that I've got today is a little bit out of left field, but really relevant on so many levels. And so I hope as we read it and as we unpack it, and there's a lot in it, I'll be honest with you, so I better crack on. Uh, so let's start and then we'll see where we get to. It's uh, Acts 15, the council at Jerusalem, and we're going to go through all the way up to verse 21, and then we're going to read 28 as well. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia, Phoenicia, oh dear, I should have read that first, and Samaria, they, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he had set, he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors had been able to bear. No, we believe it is through grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved. Just as they are, the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they'd finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. That the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name says the Lord, who does these things, the things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogue on every Sabbath. We're going to jump to chat, uh, verse 28 now. So they send a letter to them and it goes out and this is what they say in verse 28. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, 
from the meat of strangled animals and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. Don't go anywhere. Right. Let's, uh, let's get thinking about this. Does anyone remember the film Sliding Doors? Anyone watch that film? Uh, okay, there's a few of you. And it's a film effectively where uh, there are different endings. And the different endings come about based on the different decisions. So a minute decision in your life could result in a completely different outcome in your life. For instance, when I met Rachel, I met her ice skating, and my friend had fallen over and cut his hands on the side, uh, on the ice, and he was at the side. If I had not been the most caring man in the world and gone off the ice, put my arm around him, uh, I would never have met Rachel. At the time, I looked at her and said, that girl's beautiful, but Lord, I think she's too young for me, therefore, I will be good and change my thinking. And a little while later, I found out she was older, I was in. We were getting married. <laughs> Always check your thoughts first, though. <laughs> and, uh, but things can change dramatically by one decision. I remember playing a football match once. We were 1-0 up, and it was going well. We were playing in Croydon, and it was a fully African team. And I've got to tell you, whenever you play an African team, they are always athletic. So we always feared playing them because we were always not so athletic. And we were winning, and it was so good. And, uh, and I, had this, I had this ability to dream up goals before I score them. And uh, it's going to go wrong, don't worry. And uh, on one occasion, I said to the Lord, if I score from the halfway line this season, I'm going to retire and just do what you want me to do on a Saturday. And it happened. You know, and, uh, and I didn't. I was disobedient and carried on playing. Uh, but on one occasion, I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if you stood behind the goalkeeper, and as he's bouncing it, as they do, he doesn't know you're there, and you just tap the ball, and you run around him. It was one of those games where everything went the way I wanted it to. This keeper comes out, he catches the ball, he's like this, he's bouncing, and I'm like, I'm standing behind him. You know? So I go and I just put my foot round, ball rolls over there, I'm on it like a, you know, just like a whip it. And in my head I think, should I take a touch, steady myself to roll into the open goal just to make sure, or should I just hit it first time? I hit it first time, it went miles wide, and it gets worse. The whole of the opposition rolled around on their back laughing, going, you're terrible, man, you're terrible. <laughs> Why do they play you? I'm like, oh, whatever. We lost 6-1. <laughs> you know, it was all going so well. Sliding doors moment. I should have taken a touch. There are decisions in your life that can have a radical outcome in your life. This scripture today is a sliding doors moment. Men, it's more applicable to you. You know those lovely warm showers you like to have where you're just bathing in the, you know, the soap suds and, you know, just imagine that. Can you imagine it? You're going there, you're in the shower, you're enjoying the warm, the steam's up, your wife's got a cup of coffee waiting for you, I'm sure, and you, uh, you suddenly look down. Life would be different looking down for you if this scripture had not happened because you would have been circumcised. That's what would have happened. You're feeling it now. <laughs> Don't picture it, ladies. Don't picture it. <laughs> Sliding doors. This scripture would have had a radical outcome in all of our lives. Some of you got your hands over your head. Don't worry. I've never worried before. The Pharisees were teaching that unless you are circumcised, you're not saved. The Pharisees had become believers, these Pharisees, but they were still stuck in their old ways, their old traditions, and they were holding on, they were grabbing Jesus whilst holding on to the law, and they had a contaminated, polluted faith. And what they now wanted to do was to step out of faith into legalism and tradition and to apply that to all new Gentiles, Gentiles being those that weren't Jewish people that would believe in Jesus. So you're welcome, but we're going to have to do an operation on you. That's what they were teaching. And this would have had a radical outcome unless the church had done what they did, which was to be led by the Holy Spirit. Now, let's just stop there for a minute. Are we being led by the Holy Spirit in our practices, in our beliefs, both individually and as a church? Because it's mightily important that we are. Because right now, I can tell you a great apostasy is all around us. It is happening everywhere. I am bumping into it in conversations on school playgrounds. I am bumping into it in conversations with ministers. I am bumping into it when I'm talking to people about local churches. It is right on our doorstep. And the only answer is this. 
They are not being led by the Holy Spirit that brings to life the truth of Scripture. Do we want to be one of those churches? What we learn from this scripture today, and we're going to unpack it, and we're going to do a whistle-stop tour of what it teaches us about listening to the Holy Spirit and how churches can run to stay on track with God. And then we're going to look at how are we being led by the Holy Spirit. So let's dig in and have a look at how that might work. First of all, you'll see it on screen. There should be a, a nice little unreadable. Good, there we go. And uh, So in verse 1 and 5, we get this controversy. This is the controversy that says you cannot be saved unless you're circumcised. It's pretty much this. It is a Jesus plus ministry. It's yes, you can believe in Jesus. He's not enough. You've also got to do this. That's what they're teaching. It's a very polluted, contaminated faith that will lead people away from Christ. It's a small deviant that leads you into an ocean, lost at sea. Easy pickings for the devil to pick you off. Because your theology will be all over the place. You need Jesus, and it is by faith alone that we are saved, through the grace of God. The second thing, verse 2, Paul and Barnabas stand against heresy. You know, one of the things I said to you, and I'll repeat it again, just because I didn't think you listened. Uh, when I came out of COVID, I genuinely was thinking, God, am I meant to be in Rygate now and onwards? Am I meant to be here at this church? Is it time for me to consider moving on? I'm not sure. Will you speak to me? I ask that regularly because it's the right thing to be led by the Spirit to be where God wants you to be. It's not right to get your feet under the table and to sit there forever. And the first scripture that came to me was 1 Timothy 1.3. And it said, I urge you, when I went to Mas into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. It was like those words whacked me straight in the stomach. It was like God was saying to me, stay there in Rygate and ensure that false doctrine is not taught in that church. Because we are entering a time where false teaching is going to be all around you and you must stand no matter how much it hurts. So I got my answer. And it's really important that we understand how important this is to hearing from God. Note one of the conditions of the free. So they're not allowed to, uh, to eat uh, food that is sacrificed to idols, meat, and they're not allowed the blood. The other one is sexual immorality. Now, I don't want to bang on about this, but I can't help keep bumping into it every time I open the Bible. And this week, I had no idea that it was there, and it came up. It must be important that that is one of the conditions that they keep in there. Why that one? It's worth noting that when we talk about sexual immorality in the Bible, what is it? What is it? Because we know the obvious one that people talk about a lot in the moment, but what about all the other stuff, like sleeping with people before marriage, etc., etc., etc.? How do we know what sexual immorality is? The right answer is Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20. You go in there, you'll see there's bestiality. I'm not going to mention the other one because everyone's going to go, you're always banging on about that. Let's just go with bestiality and incest and all those things. And they're all in the same package. So God has made it really clear. And the interesting thing about the thing I'm not going to talk about today is that there is a word used for it. And it is only used there in the Greek Septuagint. And it's only used there. And Paul uses that very word to talk about it in the New Testament. And it's not used anywhere outside of the Bible. It is a word that he coined, and the reason he coined it was because he wanted to make sure people understood that he was talking about Leviticus 18 and 20, and there is no change. There's your obvious one. There's the easy answer. Uh, decide next week whether you return to this church. I'll be here, so uh, enjoy. But it's important that we understand we are being told to stand in this time, and if the glove fits everybody and everybody is going in the same direction, you probably find it's the wrong theology, because Jesus says that they will hate you because they hated me. It's hard to be a Christian in this world. You are in Babylon spiritually. We are in a world that is not set up for Christ. It's set up against Christ, and the spirit of the Antichrist has already gone out into the world, and one day he will be embodied as a person. But right now, don't think he isn't here. The spirit is upon us. Again, think about whether you come back next week. <laughs> it's going to get hot in this place. The next thing, so that is, Paul and Barnabas stand. Will you stand against heresy? Up to you. The next thing, verse 6, the role of the elders. The apostles and the elders met 
to consider this question, whether they should be circumcised or not. This word, to consider, means to look upon, to gaze on, and to make visible. What was happening is they were studying the scripture in the Holy Spirit and trying to make the truth visible to their congregation. I want you to know that in many churches over the years, people will come in and they will give grief to elders and people that lead in the church. And I know it happens all the time. And it probably is quite natural when the enemy's out there. I want you to know that the elders, which Paul says a point in every town, by the way, the elders are here to discern and to protect the flock of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. Love your elders. I can say that to you because I'm a pastor as well. Okay, the word actually, shepherd, is the same word. So actually they're all pastors. They just haven't been told that yet. But here's the thing. They are here to protect you. And let me tell you a little secret that you may not know. Every single elder that runs a church carries wounds. Believe me, there have been arrows that have been fashioned to hurt you and to take you down that have hit them and never touched you because they have st stood in the way of what's coming against you. Love your elders, pray for your elders, and know that none of them get paid apart from me. <laughs> Don't change that, trustees. Uh, <laughs> verse 7, the role of testimony and vision. Did you see what happened in this passage? The gifts of the Spirit have influenced this passage, and you cannot tell. Because Peter gets up and he tells them how God has sent him to the Gentiles. Now, he's saying that they're clean. We shouldn't burden them anymore. It's by faith alone. Nothing else. Can't do it through works. Why does he know that? Does anyone remember early part of Acts when the big sheep comes down in his vision and there's animals and God says, get up, Peter, go, kill, eat. And he says, I can't. They're unclean. I've never eaten anything unclean. He says, what I have made clean is clean. In other words, he's saying, the Gentiles are clean because I am making them clean for the blood of Jesus Christ. The reason he can stand up in this passage and say, this is the way it is from now on, is because he met with the Lord, and the Lord revealed to him through a vision, through the gifts of the Spirit, through what Joel talked about. He was saying, that's how I know. He didn't need to say it. It's there. He only knew this. The whole point of his ministry was released through a vision given by God through his Holy Spirit. So you've got a testimony from him. You've got a vision that has influenced his whole life. And then when we move on from that, we go on to verse 13 to 18, and the role of Scripture comes in. James stands up, and he points to Scripture. He says, look what the prophets said. They said that the Gentiles will come in. Therefore, they are okay with us. It's fine. What you see here, as I spoke about last week, you are seeing the Holy Spirit and Scripture work him in tandem to help them be led into the truths of God, to protect the flock, to grow the flock, to expand the flock, and to ensure that we don't get caught up in heresy. Isn't that exciting? Good. Looks good. The role of the church under the elders... Let me tell you something before I go on to that. When you read in Acts 2 and Acts 4 about how they sat under the apostles' teaching and they saw many wonders, let me tell you something. It doesn't get said much in churches. People are a bit shy. When God appoints leaders in your church, he doesn't appoint you, looking at the Timothy letters, to be overbearing, but he does appoint them to lead. He does. And if you're here today and you're thinking, well, I don't want elders that lead. I want elders that do what I tell them to do. Wrong church, wrong day. I can give you a whole list of new churches for you. We've got to get real about this. Because the minute we allow people that have the wrong, ungodly attitudes to influence the direction of the church, watch it shrink. Watch it shrink. We have elders appointed by God for a reason. He appoints them, and we pray about them, and you elect them by praying and discerning with God. You can't then call God a liar unless they go wonky. So, moving back to the elders with a church underneath. The apostles, the elders, and the whole church decided to choose and send men with a letter. I think this is really important. Many people have problems with memberships in, class, uh, in churches. It's true. I'm going to say it. There is no word membership in the Bible. It hardly even surfaces. But let me just give you an idea. This passage here is probably the only time you see a membership, if you like, of a church that comes into play and has a part in the direction. 
But I want to give you an idea of what happens when you don't have any membership. It means that when you come into a time like we are in and make big decisions about things we are making big decisions about, which the world are going against, you might be making decisions on the beliefs and direction in the church without membership with people that don't even believe in God. You could be sitting there in a room full of liberals, and the next thing that happens is the whole doctrine of the church has been voted out in favor of the world's doctrines, and your church no longer has God in it. Is that a good idea? Do we want to see this church destroyed? Which other churches around here right now, I'm talking to many, not just in this town, but they're in this town and beyond, they are being destroyed. They have halved in numbers. They have got barely any numbers. I know one church has gone from 65 down to 30, 40 people. You know, all on these issues because they cannot sit in unity under the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. We are a potential candidate to be one of those churches if you want to. Or we can be a church led by God. We can be a church that grows. We can be a church that reaches the nations. We can be a church that sees people that are lost become found. What do you want to be? What do you want to be? I was at Wildfires this week, and uh, we had a bishop talking to us about some of the big issues. And do you know what? One of the biggest issues for him when he was talking that I could gather, he's like, we've got four options. Can't remember them all, but one was, well, we can have the, the denomination, and we can have another section in Scotland that ordains people that do this, 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 and this. And the rest of the domino- denomination can ordain these people. And I was sitting there going, this is not going to work. The reason you're struggling is because you want to be secularly acceptable. You want to be church and state. It doesn't actually work. The only person you should be affiliated to is God and his word and his word alone, and you must follow his word in the spirit. That's who we're meant to be. We are not meant to have our policies, doctrine dictated to us by people that are lost. This is a very serious moment for the church, and I can tell you that over the next year, you are going to realize it. There are going to be churches that actually go against each other. It's so important that you understand the importance of this struggle. The next thing, verse 28, the role of the Holy Spirit. This is where we're going to lead into being led by the Holy Spirit. He said, it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit. I so want to be that church. I don't want to get up in the morning and think, how can I please everyone in the world? I want to get up in the morning and say, Lord, how can I please you? Where is it you want to lead me to today? Who can I talk to? What miracles are you going to bring in our path today? How how many people are we going to save and turn to you and truly love you? I want that life. I don't want extra seats in Parliament for the church. I want that life. I don't want even the gift day. I, I believe gift day in church is going to be taken away one day if you don't toe the line. Yeah, I said it first. Let me know when it happens. What did we see in the church of Acts? Because we want to be a church of Acts, right? First thing, we saw that they stood firm on the word of God. That's the first thing. The second thing, they had God-given leadership structures. The church needs leaders. I know enough churches right now that don't have a pastor, and I can tell you they are falling apart. You need God-given leadership structures. Then you need respect for God-given leadership. You just do. You may not like it. You may be kicking up against it. But believe me, we need it. The church needs good leaders because the reason a lot of the church is falling away from God right now is because they have poor leadership. Poor leadership. And then we see that they were led by the Holy Spirit. It seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit. Let me show you 1 Chronicles 13. I want to show you this is not an old practice, in, in the, a new practice in the Bible. This practice has been going on for years. Listen to what David said when he was deciding whether people were going to uh, join his crew, if you like. He said, if it seems good to you, and if it is the will of the Lord, let us send word far and wide to the rest of our people throughout the territories of Israel, and also to the priests and the Levites who are with them in their own towns and pasture lands. If it seems good to you, And if it is the will of the Lord, what do you think he's talking about there? He's discerning 
what the Lord wants. When we say we are led by the Spirit, it's not some weird power over there. It's God's Holy Spirit. In the Bible, it's, uh, it's described as the Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we are discerning the will of God. It's not a new practice since Pentecost. It has happened all the way back to when David was leading his people as well. We need to be led by the Holy Spirit. And this is a, a challenge I feel right now for this church and anyone out there that is a believer, I feel the Lord is saying to me, teach them to be led by me. Teach them to hear my voice because they are going to need to hear my voice in these coming days. You know, when God's people go astray in the Bible, we think about Jeremiah, and maybe we'll go to that. Um, It's interesting that God is sending them. He says, I have sent them. I have taken them into exile. I have sent Babylonia against them. God sent a nasty nation against his people. Why? Because they turned away from his word. And it's interesting that when he sends people to take out his people into exile, he says it will last 70 years. God is always, even if he is pouring out chastisement, he is always doing it with the view that he wants to bring them back. You need to know that. that If you get lost and your life goes out of control because of your choices, God wants you back. And it's interesting what what happened because Jeremiah prophesied. And as he prophesied, God told him this. He said, tell my people when they are in Babylonia, when they are in captivity, when they're in that horrible place, to plant vineyards, to have houses, to extend their families, and to pray for a blessing on, on Babylonia, the nation that took them away from their families. Pray a blessing on them, because if they are blessed, so too will you be. And then he says, it will last 70 years. So he tells them up front, it's going to last 70 years. But listen to what is said, and this is really important to us hearing from God says this, this is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place, so I just said all that, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future, always looking to bring his people back because he loves them. But listen to this, then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. You live in Babylonia. Do you not realize you're a captive to a system that is set up? Why do you think in Revelation it says Babylon the Great is fallen? It's metaphoric for the whole world that we're in. Listen, if you want some proof, just tell me how many times you picked up your phone this week. You know, 420 million people have an addiction to the internet. And most of them are probably in this room, right? (laughs) You're captive. You're in bondage. And God says, I don't want you in bondage. And if you call out to me, you will find me. But how many of us have had time to call out to the Lord? So I want to give you just a few ways you can do that as we come into land in about 25 hours. The first is this. Seek the voice of God. You know, when Elijah uh, was going to see the Lord passing by and he was looking in the fire and the wind, yeah? You remember that scripture? Uh, uh, How does God's voice come? A still, small voice. Uh, Other translations could be a gentle whisper. Another translation is a tiny voice. A tiny voice, like mine. I have a son. His name's Gideon. And he is my world, along with the others, the girls, that is. And he's just the cutest little boy ever. He gave his life to Jesus last night in bed. You know that? Isn't that amazing? (laughs) Amazing. And we, we asked if, he said, will my Teddy Edward come to heaven? We said, well, he'd have to pray the prayers where he said, no, I'll just hold him to him tight and then he'll come with me. <laughs> you know? And I said, well, fine, poor Edward. And, uh, but here, here's the thing. When he gets my attention, he goes, Daddy! And I'm like, yes, son. And as soon as I say yes, son, he goes from Daddy to, the girls are being really horrible to me and I don't know what to do. <laughs> he goes into this cute, quiet mode. And the only way I can really understand what he's saying is if I come down to his level Block out everything out. Look him in the eye and say, 
What did you say, son? The girls are being really horrible to me. <laughs> and everything in me is saying, don't tell him what your mum's like. <laughs> you will marry one day and you will realize this is just the pattern of life. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't say that. I say, let me take him. Let's go talk to them. Let's go talk to them. What's going on? And all, all hell breaks loose and I walk out. Uh, but <laughs> not really. But if you want to hear the voice of God, the reason it's a still, small voice, a gentle whisper, is because God wants you to focus on him. He doesn't want you to be holding your phone in one hand, uh, watching Netflix in the other, uh, trying to drink pints with a foot, <laughs> you know, <laughs> thinking about what he wants you to stop and listen to the still, small now, I actually almost metaphorically wet myself on Friday. You can laugh at that. It's, um, <laughs> because then it means the elders won't say, don't say that again. <laughs> but I'm sitting there reading with my girls, Nehemiah 1. And I'm like, girls, I haven't even read it yet. Something has just dawned on me. I said, I can see Nehemiah in Jesus. I can see Jesus in Nehemiah. And I've never, ever noticed it before. And you're all sitting there going, duh, you know, it's quite obvious. But I'm sitting there and going, do you realize he was cupbearer to the king? And that was to stop the king from being poisoned. So he drank the cup first and he would take it. And I said, do you realize that Jesus said to his disciple, can you drink this cup? And do you realize that he also said, you know, Father, can you take this cup? But not your will, but my will be done. And I'm going, he's, he's just like Jesus. He stands before a lost world, a, a Babylonian king or a lost people. And he takes the cup of suffering for us. I'm like, girls, do you know what this means? They're like, anyway, we <laughs> And I said, but you realize he's going back to build a new Jerusalem. Jesus is coming back to build a new Jerusalem. Why are you girls not excited about this? <laughs> <laughs> what I realized in that moment was a gentle whisper. God speaks. I wasn't even thinking about it. I hadn't even read the passage yet, but God speaks for a gentle whisper. He's speaking. And he spoke to me, I believe, in that moment to show me that he was there. And to reveal to the girls the truth. The next thing is scripture, scripture alive. Hebrews 4.12 says this, the word of God is alive and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We hear the word of God is alive and active all the time, all the time, but we always miss this point where it says, and it's discerning our thoughts, our thoughts in our head. It's discerning. The, the Word of God, you know, Jesus being the Word of God, the Father, He is discerning our thoughts through His Spirit. When we read Scripture, the reason it comes to life is because it's actually speaking to our hearts. It knows what you're thinking. You know, next time you open your Bible, you might want to go, oh, He knows what I'm thinking. <laughs> That's why it's so true. He speaks. He's discerning your heart. He knows what's on your heart before it's even on your lips. He's there, and his word is coming to life. It will jump out at you. You will get scriptures like I did with the Timothy passage and saying, stay where you are. Even if they don't like you, stay where you are. You know, there's a, I had a great story this week at, at Wildfires. There's a woman called Iona. She goes into an, uh, an airport, and she comes across this woman, uh, an Asian lady who is into spiritualism. And the woman's talking to her, and they're talking. She notices she has a crystal, and they start talking about it. And she says, well, I believe in Jesus. And uh, so they get chatting, and she has a bad back, a really bad back. She says, I want to pray for you. So she prays for her, and she goes. Next time she comes through the, the, uh, the airport sometime later, this girl seeks her out and goes, Iona, you prayed for me. My back is completely well. And she's like, it's amazing. She said, I rang my spiritualist just after that, and she said, I can't really speak to you about these matters anymore, because since we've spoke last, I've become a Christian. And she's like, what? And, uh, and so she said, I went away and bought a Bible, and I brought this Bible saying, God, if you're real, speak to me, and I know that you're the real one. And she said, I opened up the Bible, and the first name that I came across was Iona. And then Iona said, this is a bit awkward, but I don't think Iona's in the Bible. <laughs> you know, she goes, it is, let me show you. She opens it up, goes to the font that the Bible's written in, and it says, look, it's the Iona font. font. <laughs> she said, because of that, I got baptized. I'm a, I'm a born-again Christian. You know, God speaks through his word, doesn't he? 
He speaks through his word. It's amazing. But when we hear sometimes God's word, it's scary and lonely at times because not everyone is with you. And I was thinking that after COVID, I was thinking, like I'd been saying to all of you lot, look, the last thing we need right now is a vision that's over there when we've got so much work to do here. It's almost like I felt in COVID we were being shown that we're always running in a direction trying to reach a destination but losing people on the way and never really helping the people we have. And I was thinking, look, I said to you, I said, look, the last thing we need right now it is a vision that's over there. What we really need to do is to stop saying where we're going and saying who we're becoming. Do you remember that? Anyone remember that? And I also said that what we need in this new season is shepherds because the people are hurting, particularly from COVID, but also in general, we are drinking milk, not solids spiritually. And we need to work on that, not just keep saying we're going to plant this, do that, and run all the way over there. And I, I was getting nervous because everyone always wants a visionary, don't they? And they always want someone that's going to take them somewhere, uh, even if, you know, often people follow and they don't really care as long as the vision's out there. And they don't really care if the guy, in fact, how many leaders are visionaries that don't really care? If someone comes up to them and says, I'm not on board with this, well, get off then. You know, we're going in that direction. There's no care for the people that they're, they're with. They just want to achieve their targets. And I was thinking about that and I was thinking, maybe I've got this wrong. This week, through God's spoken word, Pete Hughes gets up and he speaks and he says this. He says, I believe we're in a new season as churches where we need systems and structures to change and be new. He said, I don't know what they are. And he said, we need less visionaries, more fathers and more mothers to nurture the flock. And my wife's sitting there going, Mike, you've been preaching this for two years. And I'm like, get off, woman. I want to hear what he's saying. You know, <laughs> I love you. God speaks for his word, doesn't he? So listen to his word. Next thing, wisdom released through people. Sometimes God will send a person into your life to deliver a message you may not want to hear, and it will be so important for you. We think about Moses and Jethro. Moses doing everything. Jethro's father-in-law comes for a visit, says, why are you doing all this? You are going to be exhausted. Stop it. And so he says, go and delegate. Sometimes we need to know that God speaks through people. I went to a doctor's once and I told them what I've been up to and the things I've been up to. And I said, I need help. And he said, you need to repent and be bathed in the blood of the lamb. That's not your usual doctor remedy. And he said, I will give you a blood test anyway. Blood test comes back. He says, you are organically fine. When you are organically fine and you are suffering heavily, it's probably spiritual. You need prayer. Sometimes God sends people, even weird doctors, to tell you that you need to repent. Final two things, if the band want to get ready. Visions and dreams. The prophet Joel said that we will have dreams and visions in the last day. I want to tell you today, I really believe this is on my heart, that some of you are having dreams and ignoring them. Some of you aren't having dreams because you're not asking for them. I can tell you that as, as I've been praying this year for more visions and dreams, I've had more than I've ever had. I've had to discern them. Last week I had a, drink, a dream that the elders sacked me for no reason. That wasn't of God because I asked them on Thursday. And they did say, well, there is something we need to talk about today. Let me just sit you down. But some of them will be nonsense. But don't throw them all away. Listen. Pray. Ask. If you want to be discerning what the Holy Spirit is doing, Ask the Lord to speak to you. Finally, words of knowledge. One of my favorite times, um, a word of knowledge, was when we were in this room and my brother was sitting over there. And we had a, a prophetic speaker, Zora, and he comes in and he says, you, stand up. And it was my brother. He doesn't know my brother from Adam or Eve, for that fact. And uh, he says to him, you have a disability and you think it's going to stop you from being a musician. Not true. God's going to put you in a band. And he has been in a band ever since. He's been in our band. He's been in bands in pubs. He's been everywhere in bands, despite his disability that he thought was going to stop him. That's a prophetic word. We should expect words like that. You know, Zoran turned to me at the end of that service. He goes, can I pray for you? Guess what he said to me? He said, oh, you're sharp. But not everyone's going to follow you, so just keep going. I mean, I was like, thanks. Gee, thanks. You know, he gets to be in a band. I get told no one's going to follow me. <laughs> yeah. He has not preached in this church since that word. But I will end with this. Lynn's gave me a word last week, and I hold every word as possibly true. And sometimes I'm there cynical, as we probably all are. But she said to me before the service, the Lord says you're his friend. I'm not the most silent person, am I? That floored me. 
for most of the week, I was so, not quiet, I still spoke to people, but in my quiet time, I was speechless. Because I said, Lord, that might have just been her fertile mind. Because I can't imagine that you would like me that much, even though I preach it, and I should believe it. But to hear those words, if they're true, it, it got me. And, and it's the most wonderful word I've ever had. And I don't think I'll get any, any better. That's what I want to leave you with today. He loves you. He's speaking to you. Please, please, please don't be a Christian that just fills a chair. Listen, listen, listen. Block it all out. Listen. And he will speak, and we need him in this day. Let's pray. Father, let us be people that are led by the Spirit. Let us be people that live by the Spirit. Let us be people that hear your still, small voice. Let us be people that shout for joy and dance. And Lord, yes, I know that's my alarm. Lord, I pray that you will bless us because you made us as we are. Purify us for the things that aren't what we were meant to be and cause us to walk by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.